Okay guys, so let's get the briefing up and running. Final day of week one, 2017. Payrolls day, so that'll be the focus of course this afternoon. Um, but, you know, let's just kind of scan what's happened here so far. I mean, looking at a lot of these markets, or certainly the two middle charts are my equity view. So looking at the DAX on the left, and then the S&P on the right and you'll certainly notice the last you know well certainly on the DAX chart it's very sideways um, you know, it seems to be mostly a, a range bound activity and I just wanted to talk about how this contrasts to where we were last year at the same time and because the reason why I want to look back at that is because one of the interesting stories of the of the morning or overnight has been what's been happening in terms of um, the Chinese uh, fixing the yuan currency exchange rate to the dollar, uh, fixing it higher, and actually it's the biggest um, upward fix for, uh, well, since basically 2005. So huge move, and that is the People's Bank of China fixing the exchange rate. Um, it's 2.5% up on the year, the yuan versus the dollar. Um, which is a huge move. We've obviously only had a few days. So I want to talk about that. And the reason why I want to look back at this time last year is because this time last year, and let me go to a weekly chart. I don't know if anybody was trading this time last year, but we were right in the eye of the storm. If you look at this weekly chart, then week one of, of 2016 was absolute carnage. Massive epic style sell-off that was followed and matched the week after and then even the week after that and we plummeted down to 1800 on the S&P. It was actually the first, well the, the, the best stat at the start of last year was this was the worst beginning fortnight for a year in stock market history. I think we dropped about 15% in the end. Um, now the first week of that year was dominated by China and what was happening with the Chinese central bank doing the opposite to what they're doing now. So this time last year, the Chinese central bank were um, devaluing their currency um, by huge amounts each day without really communicating why. And it was a big, it kind of just led to a bit of panic spread, you know, sort of wildfire spread of panic. You know, why are China doing this so aggressively? Is it because their economy is way worse than we thought it was you know why else would they be devaluing their currency so dramatically isn't it surely because they want to try and gain a competitive a competitive advantage in the global export market and you know it led to a lot of panic um, you had the Chinese stock market collapsing limit down um, they would introduced a new circuit breaker on their stock market which meant that if it fell by, if the index fell by 5% intraday, then the uh, trading was halted for 15 minutes. Um, let everyone just calm down. Then it would reopen. And then if it fell a further 2%, then the circuit breaker would kick in again for a second time that day. And the market would shut and it would shut for the whole of the rest of the day. I remember vividly uh, the Thursday, the first Thursday of 2016, um, we hit the first limit down 5%. Uh, I think it was after 11 minutes of the open. It then shut for 15 minutes. It then reopened. And then two minutes later, it added another 2% to finish 7% down. The second trigger came in and the market closed. So we had a, we had just over 30 minutes of trading or something in total for the day. And then it halted for the rest of the session and it, it just spilled over globally to a big panic. Obviously, where we are now, I mean, we're, we're a million miles off the kind of 1800 level that we were staring at this time last year and we're right up here at the top and actually things are quite balanced what's happened this week is actually data has been pretty solid um, i'm just going to show you a graphic obviously we've had all the uh, services and manufacturing numbers let me just change up my screenshot and look at the top left of this in fact let me just zoom in on that 
look at this chart here this is just pulled off one of the Deutsche reports but this is global macro surprises this is looking at economic data essentially it's uh, a measure of how many data releases are surprising on the upside positively relative to those surprising on the downside and as you can see um, you know both global macro surprises and the PMI new orders both have spiked uh, quite sharply higher here and you can see that this has put this uh, both of these measurements um, right up at the kind of top end of um, the typical range that we've seen for the last few years so PMIs this week have been very strong you know we've definitely been seeing multi-year highs uh, for a lot of these um, regions and so that's helped to certainly um, make the beginning of 2017 the exact opposite to last year um, there was one uh, if, um, one measure of panic in the markets other than trying to look at risk assets like equities and so on one measure is the VIX and if we look at the chart of the VIX well let's just look on a one month basis this is what's happened so far this year so the VIX is really a measure of well they call it the fear gauge this is the well, it's looking at the differential between uh, put and call option trading on the S&P 500 index. And so when this is really low, then market sentiment is positive and calm. When the VIX measurement is really high, then we panic, you know, that's panic stations. And so what's happened this year is we've definitely drifted off that, that little peak we had at the end of 2016. But it's much better to look at this on a one-year basis because look at the VIX at the start of 2016. 16 we spent the whole of the first two months um, between 20 and 30 which is elevated uh, risk it's elevated uncertainty it's very negative investment uh, investor sentiment then of course things calm down then we had a stab higher for brexit then calm then a stab higher for trump now calm and it's just a question of well you know where do we go here obviously we're down at 11.69 as you can see the value of the VIX and if I showed you on the maximum this is going back well actually it's going back 10 years and you know down here any anything in the 11s is record low kind of territory and so you know with this kind of trade you're just looking for anything doesn't matter what which breeds a bit of fear and then normally you'll get a stab above 20 how long you spend above 20 of course depends what the factor is that's led to that fear and certainly the feature of the last six months has been the time spent above 20 has been so short um, you know with the brexit and the trump events i mean we literally spent a couple of hours above 20 and then all of a sudden we're kind of reversing back lower so you know i think people are that the calm is here and it's just a question of art is there going to be a trigger point for panic so let's just go back to that first thing I mentioned and that's the Chinese currency so here's a look at the chart let me just make that a little bigger let's show you the sorry let me just show you uh, let me show you on a five-year time frame this is the value of the Chinese currency relative to the US dollar um, so it's the dollar first dollar yuan okay now if this is going up this means the yuan is weakening and the dollar is strengthening okay which you might think on the first time well hang on that's good news for China if their currency is weakening against the dollar well given their economy is geared around manufacturing and exporting well then a weakening currency is good for exporters right and that was certainly their kind of strategy look at this big step higher summer of 2015 this big straight line to the upside that's the people's bank of china beginning this process of consciously devaluing their currency okay big step there that actually bred a huge panic in global markets back in the summer of 2015 go back and check your equity charts summer of 2015 we had a, a good 15 percent sell-off in the s p as well because of this reason then they weaken their currency very sharply at the start of 2016 that's this point on the chart this led to that panic that i've just been talking about then things calmed but actually what happened was then 
the Chinese currency continued to weaken quite dramatically for the rest of the year. So you might think on the first hand, right, good for exporters, right? But actually, what's been driving, driving this, this last leg higher in this exchange rate is actually nothing to do with the People's Bank of China. This is actually now money flowing out of Ch this is this is outflows. This is this is people trying to get money out of China. If you've got Chinese, you know, yuan denominated investments and assets and you're a little bit worried about, let's say, Chinese growth um, or indeed any kind of curbs on capital controls and you just want to get your money out of there. Well, of course, you've got to sell yuan and you've got to buy well, let's say you're a dollar, uh, sorry, a, a US investor, where well, you've got to buy dollars, right, to repatriate that money. So that's selling yuan and buying other currencies, which drives the value of the yuan lower. That's what's been going on in the last part of 2016. This devaluation has nothing to do with the People's Bank of China. And actually, they're so worried about it that their strategy 12 months on is the exact opposite to what it was at the start of last year. So what they did last night this is not weakening their currency. They're now, they're now trying to strengthen it. And the reason they're trying to strengthen it is to deter people from taking their money out of China. If they can make the yuan more expensive, they will obviously then converting it to another currency is less attractive because you're going to get less of the other currency. So the People's Bank of China this year, and I know we're only a few days in, have already strengthened the yuan by 2.5%. Although you can see on this chart... It's hardly put a dent at all in that rally that we saw last year, although I don't think this chart's fully up to date, I have to say. I think we are a little bit lower than this chart implies. Um, but suffice to say, we're 2.5% higher, the yuan, this year, having dropped 6.5% last year. Okay, so a conscious effort at the start of 2017 to curb capital outflows. It's not leading to market panic. If you go back to the chart I was showing you earlier, this isn't leading to panic like we saw last year. It's because it's the exact opposite. Even though there's, again, big movements in yuan valuation, it's opposite movements. And so, you know, this is not leading to panic like we saw 12 months ago. So anyway, that might be, there might have been a story that you saw if you did your uh, reading this morning in the FT and so on. Um, right, let's let's focus elsewhere. I just want to talk about oil. I'm going to bring up my oil chart. It's been, I'd say, generally this week, it's been relatively subdued in certain assets, but 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 not oil. Um, let me just make this chart a little longer term, and we'll just look at 2017 so far. You know, the first day of the year was was notable for actually a big pop to the upside. Breaking $55, new, whatever it was, two-year high, 18-month high. Um, but then, of course, the spectacular reversal. And really, ever since that sort of epic first day of the year, we've just been drifting back higher ever since. Um, we had some certainly some volatility yesterday, of course, off the inventory data. But ultimately, we're sat, you know, still quite resilient. Um, a sell-off to the pivot and a, and a bounce, but you know here we are, just shy of 54 bucks. So where do we go from here? Well, there's a been an interesting um, report. I'm just going to show you the Twitter feed here. Um, we've had a, a tweet earlier on. Saudi Arabia has cut oil output by at least 486,000 barrels a day. This takes their output down to just shy of, or just above 10 million barrels. This would imply, if correct, that this is Saudi fully implementing their OPEC cut pledge. Okay. Now, there's an article on this in, in, on, on the Bloomberg website this morning. Uh, if I just put that into the, um, the, the room for you to click on and have a look at, because this is talking about, well, when are we going to find out if OPEC actually deliver their promised cuts or not? And, uh, you know, this article is talking about, well, actually, we've really got to wait till the end of January, start of February, before we then get kind of output data for January. And then we can see, right, well, how much have they produced? And is it lower than last year? And are they fulfilling their promises? Um, so, you know, to, to be 
100% confident that Saudi are actually cutting. You really do have to wait until the end of the month. But what we do have here, end of week one, is some sources indicating that it looks like Saudi Arabia are going ahead with that plan. Okay, so this is something to, to factor in. If we go back to the oil chart, you know, this is why we're resilient on the downside. That move to the downside on, on Tuesday was weird in that it really came off nothing um, other than what I would call profit taking. It's just that a lot of people aren't satisfied with profit taking being a reason. But I think this was a perfect example of that's exactly what happened because we hit $55, uh, which happened to be uh, my price target with my bet with VAS. And uh, <laughs> coincidentally, this triggered, I, I think, just some, some profit taking, which triggered a bit of downside momentum. And, and what you've got to understand about these kind of markets is that there's a lot of algos out there. There's a lot of machines that are operating off momentum indicators. They're measuring directional momentum, and then they're trying to jump on that and ride that. So if you can generate enough momentum in a direction, then you can really get the algos jumping on it. And that that momentum extends. And, and I think this is just a classic example of that on Tuesday. Booking profit at 55 bucks, there was enough profit taking for, for momentum indicators to rise above certain thresholds and for them, the computers to get involved. And then we had some technical breaches and then other people panic a little bit and dive on the profit taking scenario and all of a sudden you know you wind up three dollars lower down at 52 bucks so really we've just been reclaiming those losses ever since and i think that will continue you know and this rumor this morning about saudi fulfilling their obligations on production cuts should help for the climb back to 55 dollars as we you know go through next week that would be my opinion uh, but certainly oil's been one of the you know the big movers of the week um so let's have a look at some other, before we talk about payrolls and, and, and what's going to happen today, let's have a look at the dollar because the dollar's had a bad start to the year. If we looked at, um, well, I'll put a weekly chart for euro dollar to get it into perspective first. I say a bad start to the year and that the dollar has weakened about one and a half percent. And But putting it in the bigger picture, we're still down here in the consolidation zone. Um, having had the big sell-off since Trump's win, okay? So even though the dollar's been weak, euro dollar's still right down here at the bottom of this move lower. Uh, but when you're looking just over the course of this week, then generally speaking, um, we've had, after that opening day weakness where we did set a new low down below the 104 handle, since then, it's generally been a drift back higher. So we'll see. And that's been helped by the fact we've had, you know, really solid European data. But we have had good U.S. data as well. Um, although, I guess, the ADP employment report wasn't particularly um, good yesterday. But outside of that, the U.S. has had good data, good ISM numbers, um, you know, jobless claims down in the two, 230,000s. You know, that's, that's notably low. So... Uh, but it's just, a, again, a bit of profit taking after what was a very strong year for the dollar last year. Let's have a look at a couple of other things then. Um, firstly, we've had some data this morning already, which needs to be looked at. Here's a chart. This is German data. It needs to be made note of because actually having had a really solid week for data, well, actually this morning we've seen seem to have had a bit of a reverse on that. So this was the German factory orders numbers that were delivered at minus two and a half percent. You know, this is this is a decent an important number for Germany. Um, we were ex I have to point out we were expecting minus two point three percent. So actually this numbers come in not too far off what was expected although it is worse but you know what's notable of course it's the worst number for 12 months but what you've got to understand is what happened the month before which was an absolute giant reading of five percent if i take this chart back longer term well then it's very typical to see you know anything above four percent rarely happens we've only had we only had this is the third reading in five years above four percent Okay, and it's the second highest reading 
in five years. That's the October print. And whenever you get one of these really high prints, you inevitably get a reversal the following month. So you've got to put this in context and understand that, um, okay, on the face of it, it looks really bad, but actually it's within the ranges we've seen for the last two years. And we've just gone from top side to bottom side, which is quite typical. So I don't think there's anything to get alarmed about. And of course, markets certainly aren't being alarmed. Uh, the DAX is bang in the middle of the day's range, which is bang in the middle of yesterday's range which is bang in the middle of the range from the day before, basically the DAX hasn't moved all week. So this data, even though it looked bad, isn't actually all that alarming. Similar kind of print on German retail sales. Very similar story. Really strong October, which is then, of course, offset by a weak November. These are month-on-month -month comparisons, of course. So if you get a really, really strong month, or well, the month after unless you get an even stronger month, which is unlikely, you're most probably going to get a reversal on the, on the kind of data calendar. So that's why these numbers this morning haven't really had any kind of effect uh, on markets. Um, let's have a look at the economic calendar whilst I'm talking about data. So what we have at 10, so we've gone through some of that German stuff earlier on. 10 o'clock, we've got European numbers, uh, retail sales, um, we've got some sentiment numbers then on business and in, uh, industrial uh, consumer confidence. These sentiment numbers out of Europe don't tend to, well, they're not no way tier one. They don't tend to get looked at particularly. It's not like consumer confidence in the U.S. is actually quite, uh, can be a market moving figure. It's not the case for Europe. Um, just uh, markets just don't tend to be too bothered by it. Same with kind of retail sales. I guess it's just so old, this number. It's November. I don't know why Europe take, takes so long to measure their retail sales data, but this is for November. So bear that in mind. It's pretty old. So again, another reason why, you know, it's not particularly important. We've had data all week out of Europe for December. So when you start to get November numbers, it's like, well, actually, that's less relevant. So these numbers at 10 shouldn't have much of an impact. Of course, this afternoon, we have a very important number. It's called non-farm payrolls. So just understand that this morning, with regards to your trading, you know, you definitely want to, well, patience would be the key word. Um, most likely, you're going to get quiet markets. I would say typically, in the long term, it's probably easier to lose money on the morning of non-farm payrolls day than it is to make money. You know, if you had a, a fixed policy as a trader to never trade payrolls mornings, then in the long run, that would probably be the right policy. It doesn't mean to say there's never any opportunities that arise. It's just that most likely there won't be any really good opportunities. And, you know, given the importance of the data this afternoon, um, you know, you can expect some decent momentum. So you're probably better off keeping your ammunition in its box ready for later on. Um, so on the payrolls front, we'll do a preview to this in much more detail later. But at the moment, we've got a 178 um, forecast according to this calendar, although I think it's down to 175 now, isn't it? Anyway, basically in line with the month before. Um, if we take a look at the chart here, we got 178 yesterday. Uh, not yesterday, last month. So this is the November job creation figure, 178,000, um, which is, as you can see, pretty much roughly the average of the last four months. And actually, it's pretty much the average of the last 12 months, in fact. Anything between 150 and 200 is about, you know, the last 12 months average. So you're going to need to see figures above 200 or below 150, I would say, today to really get markets interested. Um, of course, the Fed made their move in December. They hiked. And so this data now, I would say, becomes less important than perhaps it might ordinarily be. And the other reason for that is really what people are waiting for is Trump. We want Trump in the Oval Office and we want to see what he does. And so payrolls data for December, you know, well, not that important in the grand scheme of things. Sure, it'll create 
short-term volatility this afternoon, which can create some good trading opportunities. But don't expect dramatic momentum moves off this data this afternoon, because really we're just waiting for Trump. So just bear that in mind. The other thing to point out is I'm going to show you the unemployment chart here. It might be the unemployment data today is more important than it normally is. And that's because of what happened in November. It dropped to 4.6%. That's the lowest since 2007. And the reason why it's perhaps more important is because of what the Fed said at their meeting in December. We got the minutes from that on Wednesday. And there's now more Fed members who are worried that the unemployment rate is going, going to undershoot the... Uh, its natural level. What what that means is, and it sounds a bit contradictory, the Fed are saying, we're worried the unemployment rate is going to be too low. But surely lower unemployment's good, right? But what they're talking about is the unemployment rate getting too low, which means almost like too many people are employed. And then you start worrying about inflation. Because if you're getting everyone employed demand for goods goes up inflation rises and then the fed have got a problem in tackling that so you've got fed members now talking about unemployment rates undershooting and that being a risk so it'll be interesting to see if 4.6 percent can be maintained it's a it's a 10-year low or can it even go lower i mean just on the economic data calendar here i'll show you we've got a, a forecast for it to go back up to 4.7 percent but it might be the unemployment rate gets a bit more interest than normal. Also look out for average hourly earnings, because if we do get a month-on-month -month print of 0.3%, then that will lead to the annualized number ticking up to 2.8%, which again will be a multi-year high. So that, again, from an inflation point of view and thinking, are the Fed going to hike three times this year, et cetera, et cetera, then we're going to need some inflationary pressures to come through. However, having said all of that, really, we, we need to wait for Trump. We need to see what he's going to do and what effect that has on data. That really is, is what's going to drive 2017. We've got a call. <laughs> the other thing that's going to drive 2017, um, Anthony Chung here has uh, put a call out on the call board. Well, uh, not just me. Well, I, yeah, we got a couple of new entries on our call board this morning. Will DeLucy has, I, I spoke about the VIX. Let me get that chart back up on the screen for you. Um, I spoke about the VIX. Will thinks the VIX is going to hit 20 during 2017, which means something's got to happen. A Brexit or a Trump type event has to happen for the VIX to move above 20. The other one is, and I like this, you heard it, heard it here first, Anthony Chung calling a UK general election in 2017. So that's going to be driven by Brexit-related factors. It's going to be driven by something happening leading Theresa May to effectively, if you like, I mean, a, a general election this year would be a proxy for a second referendum on leaving the EU. What would happen is Theresa May would call an election, run on a mandate of staying in the EU, only if something changes within it. You're going to need some political event in Europe, like Le Pen winning, for example, to lead a push towards the EU themselves, recognising, all right, we need to change. Then that move towards change being enough for Theresa May to say, well, you know what, because the EU are changing, actually it's now we're better off staying in, so let's have a general election to decide. That, that would be how that comes about. Of course, whether that comes about or not, that's, that's for debate. You would need Le Pen winning. I don't think that'll happen, personally. Merkel losing might be something else to think about. Anyway, that's a big call from Anthony Chung, General Election, UK 2017. Uh, right, let me just finish on the charts. So as I was saying, you know, keep it tight, I would say this morning, for sure. Um, you know, make sure you've got some ammunition. I mean, the, the most idiotic, ridiculous scenario, which happens a stupid amount of times, 
is to see a trader hit their daily stop limit the morning of non-farm payrolls. It's like, it's like, I don't know, what is that like? It's like you've got a, it's like you've got a 10 year old Skoda, you've won a track day driving Ferraris around Silverstone, and on the way to Silverstone, you crash your Skoda and get taken to hospital. That's the kind of analogy of getting stopped out on the morning of non-farm payrolls, okay? <laughs> Don't be that person. All right. Enjoy the day. Thanks a lot.